Uh, this morning, I want to ask that we all do something before we dive into the passage. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be in John 20 today. But in order to fully understand the mindset of those that we're talking about in John 20, I want to go back about a week before the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want to ask us to do this together. Um, would everybody bow their heads for me and just close their eyes for a second because I want to eliminate all distractions. I just want you to hear the words that I'm saying and in your mind and heart, allow them to come to life for you, almost to place you back in the same situation that they are experiencing. And if you know the story of the gospel and you know uh, the last week of Jesus, it starts on this day that we call Palm Sunday. And that is the day that King Jesus walks or rides in to Jerusalem on a donkey, on a colt. And it was a prophecy fulfilled all the way from Zechariah where it says the king of the world, the Messiah, will walk in, or sorry, ride in through the gates of Jerusalem. And what's happening at this time is there's a ton of uh, Jews there because they're at the Passover festival in the city of Jerusalem. And so they know what's happening. And so they all kind of gather around the gate of Jerusalem and they all have palm branches. And as Jesus rides in on this donkey, they all start waving these palm branches and they shout this word, Hosanna. That word literally means savior. They say he is here. And so in that moment, you have those who know the Messiah has finally appeared to us. God has promised us for thousands of years now that Messiah is coming, that he is coming to rescue and to redeem his people, to bring his people victory. And it has finally occurred, and the, the city knows this, and they know this, and they show that they know it by saying, Hosanna in the highest and waving palm branches. Then about four days after that, Jesus is in this room with his 12 disciples, maybe a couple other people, and he shares what we know as the Last Supper. And he shares this with his disciples, that the bread that you're about to eat represents my body that is about to be physically broken for you. Now, they didn't understand fully what is happening here, but they're listening to this. And then he gets this cup of juice and he passes it around and he says, now this cup represents my blood that is shed for you. And it establishes this new covenant. And I just want to say here that without the blood of Jesus, there is no Easter. That the shedding of the blood of Jesus on the cross purifies and redeems and it cleanses all of mankind of their sins. If it wasn't for the shed blood of Jesus, we would not be here today to celebrate the resurrection. Let's understand that. And he, and he tells this to his disciples and then he washes their feet and then they all set out on this journey to this garden. At this garden, this is when the last days of Jesus become a reality. And he starts to bleed blood, literally. Sweat blood because of the anxiety he's going through, the thought of what he's about to suffer. And then shortly after that, you have these Roman guards. You have the chief priests, and they all come, and they confront Jesus there in that garden. And one of his disciples, the ones that he loves, the one that he spent time with, that he uh, has allowed to go out and literally do miracles through, and it tells us, the Word of God tells us, that he sold Jesus to these guys for, for silver, that this God who was on the throne, who created all things, even Judas, allowed this to occur, allowed to be sold for silver. And then these guards put these handcuffs on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. These handcuffs led by a chain, and they physically drag him to this dark, cold prison cell. Let your mind go there. You can almost hear the metal of the door as it locks Jesus inside this dark, cold cell. And then a couple hours later, what happens is this man named Pilate then brings Jesus on this platform, on this stage. And, and he looks to that crowd, the same people who are waving palm branches, and he looks to them and he gives them an option. He says, I'm gonna let one of these two guys free. And it's up to you to decide, who do you want to go free? Is it going to be this murderer, this thief named Barabbas who has caused a lot of issues in the community? Do you want this murderer to go free? Or do you want this man named Jesus who is innocent as far as Pilate could tell? 
The crowd who once cried Hosanna then cried the name Barabbas. Send Barabbas free. For this man, Jesus, what we want is for him to be crucified. So they drag Jesus. They tie him to this post and they beat him 39 times with this whip made of bone and iron and rocks and glass. And it's so excruciating that every single time this whip hits the skin of Jesus, it digs in. And what they do then is rip it out. So every single time for 39 lashes, Jesus' body is being mutilated, ripped apart. And the disciples and some of the disciples and Jesus' mom is actually watching this occur. Then I wasn't enough. So what they do then is they tie this wooden beam to Jesus and it weighed almost 100 pounds. And what they make him do, they force him to carry the instrument of death. The thing he will be tied to, nailed to, and they force him to carry it up on this hill. When they finally make it to the top, the Roman guards shove Jesus down and and they extend his arms and they tie a rope around his his forearms, and they nail these iron spikes through his wrist and through his feet. Then, for all the world to see, almost like a trophy of look what we have done, we have crucified this false king, this guy who thinks he's God, so they raise him up for the world to see, here he is. We've accomplished it. Jesus hangs on the cross till every ounce of blood has been shed out of his body. The final words of Jesus as he looks to God and he says, it's done. I've accomplished my purpose. I have paid the debt of their sin. And tells us he gave up his spirit and then just to make sure that he is truly dead, they get this spear and they shove it in the side of Jesus But the Bible tells us no blood, just water, for there is no blood left. Then after that, they, two men named Nicodemus and Joseph, they take the body of Jesus down and they wrap it in these grave clothes. And the Bible tells us that they put spices on Jesus' body and they carry it and they put it in this tomb. And just to make sure no one can go in or out, they roll this massive stone and they seal the body of Jesus where he will rest forever. At that moment, all hope was lost. Hosanna the Savior is now dead without blood or breath in his lungs. Now I want you to imagine what the disciples are feeling what his mom is feeling. All those who Jesus preached the gospel to, all those who received miracles from Jesus, and now this man who claimed to be God is lifeless in this tomb. Once your heart kind of reconciles that, I want you to open your eyes. And that's where we pick up in John 20. Will you read this with me? Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to that tomb where the dead, lifeless body was laying. She said he came, she came so early that it was still dark out. And what does it say? She saw that massive stone taken away from the tomb. And Mary, not knowing what to do, it says in verse two, she immediately ran and got Simon Peter and the other disciple who Jesus loved. And she said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. In that moment, they have experienced all that I just described to you. Their heart is heavy. Their mind is confused. They have no idea what is going on. All they knew is I'm going this day to go visit the tomb of the one that I call Jesus. And when she gets there, the stone is completely rolled away. Now, I want to, as we talk about this, we're going to break down the first couple of verses of, of this chapter. And there's a lot of things that we're going to pull out of that, one, to apply to our lives today, but also to really teach on the meaning of the resurrection, 
But I wanted you to get in the mindset of what they're feeling so that you can truly understand the meaning of the resurrection, how there is an empty tomb right now. When all hope is lost, the one you put your faith in, your trust in, you, you give everything to, your life to, you dedicated it to it, and now he's laid in a tomb. And now they get there and there is no body. And so in this passage, there's four main people that we're gonna look at. Mary Magdalene, who we just got introduced to. Then it says Peter and the, the one that Jesus loved, the disciple Jesus loved, that is John, the one who wrote this book. And then the fourth, we're gonna obviously talk about Jesus today. Those are the four people that this passage really speaks to. And out of those four people, we're gonna get some life lessons in this and how to apply them to our everyday lives in the meaning of the resurrection. Before we get there, let's go back and break this passage down to give um, some context to what's happening. It says, on the first day of the week. So gotta remember, Jesus dies on Friday, on our, our calendar Friday. So they had to get Jesus's body down before the sun went down because the next day was Sabbath and nobody could work. According to the law in Jewish culture, God told them, you cannot do anything on the Sabbath day except rest. And so Nicodemus and Joseph, they did as fast as they could to get Jesus's body down from the cross, prepare it for burial by wrapping grave clothes around Christ, but also putting spices on him. So back in this culture, kind of like we do today to prepare a body for the casket to be put into the ground, they would do it a little bit different where they would wrap these grave clothes to kind of preserve the body, and then they would add spices to it. And the Bible tells us that Nicodemus and Joseph put almost 70 pounds of spices. And the point of that is one, to show respect for, that, for, that, for those who just died. But also the spices mask and cover up a lot of the smells of the body who is, who is decomposing. And so they do all this for multiple reasons. They put perfume, spices, even aloe to control the, the body actually decomposing and to help the smell of that be, a, be at a minimal. So what's happening here is when we see Mary had a desire to get to that tomb as early as possible. She couldn't go on Saturday. So she said as soon as the first day of the week, which is Sunday, came up, she ran there. Now, she might have gone for multiple reasons, maybe just to visit, to talk, to hang out. But we know that one of the reasons is that she could actually finish preparing Jesus's body. Because they had to rush and hurry to do it so much, they weren't able to do it as it should have been done, to fully prepare Jesus' body to lay in a tomb for the rest of, of, of life. So Mary gets up, and she runs as fast as she can to this tomb. Now, let's first talk about Mary before we go a little bit farther, because the Bible doesn't say too much about Mary, but she plays an important role in Scripture. Now, we know where she's from. Uh, we know kind of what she did, where she traveled alongside Jesus some, some of the time where she probably prepared some meals for Jesus and the disciples, probably ran some errands and supported the gospel, the mission of the gospel by serving Jesus. But the Bible also tells us one fact about Mary that is very relevant to this and at the end of the passage when we get to it is that it tells us in Mark 16, 9, the history of Mary, the past of Mary. And it tells us that Mary, at one point before she met Jesus, was possessed by seven demons. She had seven demons in her and controlling what she did. So if you think about that, Mary at one point was probably living a lifestyle that she didn't want to live, sinning in a way that she did not want to sin, and being tormented, tormented mentally, but also physically on the inside. There's nothing she could do. Seven demons were controlling all that Mary did. And the Bible tells us that it was Jesus himself that delivered Mary from demon possession. It was Jesus himself who literally saved Mary from this torment, giving Mary a complete new outlook on life. Renewing Mary's purpose for her life was Jesus when he delivered these demons from her. And I wonder if that played in some of the devotion that Mary displayed by getting up early and running to that tomb, where she got up early to then anoint the one who saved her. But in all this, let's not miss that she came prepared and ready, expecting to find the dead body of Jesus. Spices in tow, carrying them to, to this tomb to prepare the body. She fully expected Jesus to be dead. I want us to now understand her response when she gets to the tomb and when she sees the stone rolled away. You would think that Mary played, paid close attention 
to the words of Jesus when he was on earth teaching and preaching the gospel. See, Jesus multiple times in his ministry prophesied that, yes, they will kill me, but they won't, they won't have victory, for I will raise from the grave. So Mary, in her, somewhere in her mind, she probably had an understanding that Jesus said at one point, he will raise from the grave, for he will die, but he will also come to life. But did you notice the reaction that Mary had when she saw the tomb rolled away? It wasn't, Jesus has risen. It, it wasn't, look what Jesus did. He did what he was going to do. He fulfilled his own prophecy. It wasn't, he really is the Messiah. He really is the Lord. That was not her response. Her response was in verse two. Her immediate response to this tomb being taken away and nobody in the tomb was they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. They have stolen the body of Jesus and now we don't know where they are. I think that's important for us to understand because believe it or not, in that situation, we too have the same response a lot of times as Mary did. Mary had no anticipation that Jesus would be alive. She fully expected a dead body in that tomb. So in the shock, in the surprise, in the stress of the situation, she completely forgot everything Jesus ever told them about his resurrection. And so many times in our life, this happens to us, where we let the unexpected situations, the stresses of life, the anger that builds within us when someone does something to us uh, that hurts or disrespects us. Every single time, the devil comes in and tries to tempt us to fall into a sin or to drag you back to your past. Every time, we completely forget the promises of Jesus. But what we do is believe this fake lie or this fake scenario of what we perceived to have happened. She didn't even second guess this. She didn't even think, could it be possible that he rose from the grave? It wasn't even a thought in her mind. She automatically perceived something to happen, a made up scenario. She knew in the depths of her heart, someone stole the body. In our situations in life, because we will have situations come up in life. And in those moments, what we have to do is fight through the power of the Holy Spirit to diminish the fleshly mindset and rely only on the words of Jesus. It is so important that we have the words of God imprinted in our hearts and in our minds so that when those things come up, we don't go back to lies and false situations. We go back to the promises of the word. I say this a lot because it's always true. If we don't have our minds and our hearts in line and focused on Jesus, then there's going to be a gap in our thinking. There's gonna be a gap in our thinking and in our feeling. And what happens in that gap is the devil will always, it's not sometimes, will absolutely always start to creep in and fill the narrative of that situation. I say this all the time because it's so true. The devil will get within your mind and start to deceive you or, or, or to change your thought process to take it off of what could be and sell you a false lie or a fake story. If you start wandering in your thinking, the devil will come in and take hold of your mindset and bring it to the opposite direction. And this is proof of that. Mary heard the truth but she did not understand and know the truth, so what happened is she allowed the devil to get in. And listen, I'm not throwing shade at Mary. What would your response be? What is the response in your life to all these situations? It's not, Lord Jesus, I know this is hard, but I can't wait to get past it and glorify you. Most of the time is, why are you doing this? How could you do this? And the devil fought, fills this fake narrative of the situation and sells you a lie. But I just wanna say, before we even get started in this, we have the power through the Holy Spirit to fight and defeat the schemes and attacks of the devil. We do not have to fall into the lie. We can stand firm on the truth of the words of Jesus. So here's what she does. She allows the devil to fill in this narrative. Someone stole the body. So then it's not just belief for her. She runs back and gets Peter and John. And so now the story transitions to these two guys. She then tells them someone stole the body. So what happens then? Look at verse three and four. After John and Peter hear from Mary, 
It says, Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Real quick note on here. So many pastors point this out, and I'm going to too because it is just funny. John has a way to humbly brag. Have y'all noticed this before or heard this before? Like John is a humble person, and we're gonna see here, he's, a, he's one of the meek disciples where he has a, a different way to perceive things, and he has a different personality. But at the same time, he still, because he's a man, has some pride in him. Did you notice the first scripture, how we would not list his name as John? Like John that we're speaking of is the one who wrote the book of John. He's also the other disciple that he refers to. So we'll call Peter by name, but he's too humble to put his own name in here, so he'll just say the disciple that Jesus loved. Like throwing shade at the rest of the disciples. Like I want y'all to know, Jesus loves you, but I'm the one that he really loved, right? Then he says this in, this in verse four. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter. Like he wants you to know, he loves me more and I'm faster than you. Isn't that what men do? Like we love to throw that. We love to say that. Hey, I just want you to know, I'm humble, but I'm also faster, all right? So he says this. We can, like, can we have fun today? Come on. I guess not. We'll get there. So when they hear the news from Mary, without hesitation, they sprint towards the garden where the tomb is, and they look for Jesus' body. Look at verse 5 and 10, 5 through 10. And stooping to look in, this is John because he got there first, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes that, uh, that they wrapped around him, and he saw them lying there. But here's the note. He did not go in. See, this is the meekness I'm talking about. His personality was, I don't know what's going on here, so I'm gonna stop for a second. I'll look in, but I'm not going in yet. So he stayed on the outside of the tomb. Then verse six. But Peter is a completely different personality. Peter doesn't care. Peter's the alpha. Peter just rushes in, and he says, Peter, following John, went into the tomb, and he saw the same thing, the linen cloth lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, but it was not lying with the linen cloth. It was folded up in a place by itself. Then it says in verse 8, that's when the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. Now, I love this. Then he saw and believed. But for as yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So after this, to end this scene, the disciples went back to their homes. So let's break this down to understand. They rush to the tomb. John gets there first. He looks in, but he doesn't go in. He just examines from the outside. Now, in those verses, those five verses, you might have noticed that there's this word saw, S-A-W, and every single time it's used, it's used in a different way. As they would write in Greek, they could use the same word, but sometimes the words have a deeper meaning or a different meaning. Now, they all mean to see with your eyes, but it's the outcome of what you see was what changes. So, for instance, in verse 5, when it says he, John stooped in and saw the linen clothes, that definition is more of like what you and I see. Like, I see you there, you're sitting in a chair. I see that. That's nothing to it. I just see, and there it is. So all that means is John looked in, saw linen clothes, and it didn't mean anything to him yet. He just saw them. Now, verse uh, 6 when it, when it talks about Peter, he went in, and then it says he saw. So that saw is completely different than what John experienced. See, that word saw actually means something a little bit more. It means that he looked in his eyes, and then he stopped for a second. And it means what he saw, he, mean, he, he started to contemplate, to observe, to look around, to scrutinize. So Peter walks in, and it's not just, I see, it means nothing other than I know it's there. It means that he goes into this tomb and with a very critical eye, observes everything about it. See, in this moment, Peter starts to remember what Mary said, someone stole the body. But then Peter looks in and sees the linen cloths lying on this stone bench where Jesus' body was, and he sees how they're orderly and folded up. And that's when he saw, begins to contemplate and observe and say, something isn't right here. The details of what's going does not match what Mary said about someone coming in and stealing the body. Now, there is no body. There's just the grave clothes, but they're neatly folded, so something is different of what's going on. And this is a big point. 
So you remember, she said someone stole the body, but that's actually something that to, to today people still use as a defense to prove that Jesus really didn't raise from the grave. There's three main ones that people will throw at you if they don't believe Jesus rose from the grave. Number one is that they really didn't put him in the tomb that scripture said. That they didn't put him there, they just said that, and now they moved him or they put him in a completely different tomb. So he didn't raise from the grave, he's just in a different spot. The other one is that Jesus really didn't die. So he might have been unconscious, but when they put him in the tomb, he was able to walk out himself because he didn't die. But that we know is completely false Because multiple people, including Roman soldiers who have no skin in this, who want him dead, shoved a spear in his side, watched him breathe his last, knew that there was no blood or breath left in his body. So that can't be. The third reason why people will sell a false narrative and say Jesus didn't raise from the grave is this. Even today, some even right now in Jerusalem who don't believe in the Messiah will tell you Jesus didn't raise from the grave, but they would go with what Mary said. Someone stole the body. But let's for a second think logically about that. Let's just go to scripture for a second and understand what is actually happening around this tomb. And you make your own logical conclusion. Could someone have stolen this body? After Jesus was laid in the tomb and wrapped in graves clothes and 70 pounds, 75 pounds worth of spices, this stone that could have been hundreds of pounds was rolled in front. Okay, so not only that, but what we can see in scripture is that the chief priests, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, went to Pilate, and they remembered what Jesus said. He wasn't shy about his resurrection. And so they remember that at one point, Jesus said, he will raise from the grave. And so the chief priest, the one who ultimately got Jesus killed, went to Pilate, the Roman governor, and said, hey, Jesus said this, can we put guards around the tomb so no one could get in and get the body and no one could get out of the tomb? So they themselves set this up. Then they rolled the stone over. Then they wrapped Jesus in these grave clothes. So let's think about this. Let's think about what kind of criminal it would have taken for someone to sneak past the Roman guards, to roll a hundred pound massive stone away, unwrap the body of Jesus, then neatly fold the grave clothes and leave them on the bench. That criminal was either a ninja who threw shade at the disciples by folding the grave clothes, or no one actually stole the body. You think logically about what could have actually happened. Roman soldiers don't play around. If you were caught, you were killed. Do you think people would have really risked that to sell a lie that Jesus raised from the grave? Clearly, that is not what happened. Clearly, Jesus' body not being in the tomb was not the work of enemies. And when Peter got in, he started to put these things together. The grave clothes meant something supernatural happened inside that tomb. Now look at John's response. This is the third saw. When Peter went in and he's scrutinizing everything and something's starting to click, then John walks in too. And it says, he then saw and believed. See, this version of Saul, this definition of the word Saul means to understand and to perceive the significance of what just took place. See, John, like Peter, is starting to put the pieces together. And he looked at the arrangement of the grave clothes, and and he put two and two together, and he says, nobody actually stole the body. Jesus did what he said he was going to do. He rose from the grave. He saw it, and what he saw made him believe that what Jesus prophesied about actually occurred. See, Jesus did the opposite of what Mary did. John did. John did the opposite of what Mary did. He went into the tomb. He stopped for a second. He looked around, he examined, slowly examined what had happened. And and instead of running through this false narrative of what happened, he slowly started to believe because he took time to understand what's happening. The burial wrappings reminded John, Jesus said, I will raise from the grave. But here's an interesting fact about this. He saw and believed, but look at verse nine. But he did not understand the scripture, that he must be raised from the grave. He believed in the resurrection, but he did not understand the meaning of the resurrection. And I have a feeling that's a lot of us today too, that we understand and believe in the resurrection, 
but we don't have a clue what that actually means for us. This is my proof in this. If someone asked you, matter of fact, let me ask you so we can get some audible voices out here. Do you believe that Jesus rose from the grave? Okay, without hesitation, you said yes. So you believe the facts of the resurrection. However, you don't have to answer this out loud, but in your heart, do you know the meaning of the resurrection for your life? Like the depth of the resurrection for your life? Do you know what that actually means for you and for the whole world? Most of us miss that point. The historical fact is there, but we miss the meaning. And and I have evidence for that too, because for a lot of us, including myself and a lot of believers, the reason I know we don't truly understand the meaning of the resurrection is because we're still stuck in the same rut, still stuck in the same sins, still stuck in the same struggles, same issues, and we allow the same burdens to pile on top of us. If we truly understood the outcome of the resurrection, then we would be able to climb out of those graves the same way Jesus did. We understand the facts, but we don't understand the meaning. And just because something happened doesn't mean it's rich with meaning. See, we allow the meaning of the resurrection to get numb to us because we see things all the time in this world that happen, and it means nothing. It's not rich with meaning. And so if I just believe the fact, that is enough. Well, yeah, but you also need to understand the meaning to benefit your life. So what does the resurrection mean? What does it mean for you? What does it mean for your kids? What does it mean for your marriage? What does it mean for your relationships? What does it mean for the world? The resurrection means everything. That all of those things we struggle with, if we actually understood the resurrection, we no longer have to live or give in to those things. Will we have them come up? Of course we will. But we don't have to sit in the sorrow and misery of those things. We don't have to sit in the burdens of them or the shame or guilt of sin because the resurrection means everything. Now, let me break this down because in reality, that doesn't help us that much. The resurrection means everything. Cool, good to know. Thanks, Pastor. No, what are the real implications of the uh, resurrection? I got five of them to to go through pretty, pretty quick. The first one, the meaning of the resurrection Well, the meaning of the resurrection completes the truth about Jesus. Again, it is a historical fact. I could give you fact after fact, and you could actually put your own eyes on all of these things that Scripture tells us about uh, Jesus' death in the resurrection. But it is a historical fact that Jesus rose from the grave. That is true. But if you have this man who claims to be God, says he's God, does all these miracles, and then dies but never raises again, everything he said was a lie. He's not indeed God. God can't die. So the fact that Jesus died but then rose completes the truth about who he is. It confirms that he is who he said he is, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the King of the entire world. The fact that he rose from the grave means that he himself is God, sent in the flesh to take away the sins of the world. Jesus claimed to be God, and raising from the grave proved it. Every resurrection in Scripture is different than Jesus's. There's multiple people who Jesus rose from the grave, raised from the grave, but every single one was different than Jesus's resurrection. See, they might have been raised to life from death, but at some point, they died again. They still died and they were still buried and put in a tomb never to be alive again. But Jesus' resurrection was different. He was raised from the dead and then raised to never die again. He was raised to create this new order of life, everlasting life, true resurrection power. That's what Jesus did. And his true resurrection power proves that everything Jesus said about himself is true. True, the words match up with the action of his resurrection. So the first thing, it completes the truth about who Jesus is. The second thing that the resurrection means, it is our assurance of our resurrection. The Bible tells us that we as God's people who have put their trust and faith in Jesus can be assured with certainty that we will also raise from the dead when Jesus comes to receive his people to himself. It is with certainty that that will happen. The Bible describes Jesus' resurrection as the first fruits or the preview, or if you will, the first one in a line of a bunch of people who will be resurrected. He is the step one in the resurrection of God's people. 
So for us today, if you put your faith in Jesus, Jesus' resurrection means for you that you too will rise and be with him in heaven for all of eternity. Therefore, what that also means is we no longer have to fear death. Now, you might fear the cause of death, like I don't want to be eaten by sharks. I'm terrified of that. True story. But I might fear the cause of death, but I don't fear the outcome of death. Even if sharks eat me, I'll have a restored body in the presence of God for all of eternity because Jesus brought in this new order of resurrection life, everlasting life. The third thing, the resurrection means that God has an eternal plan for the bodies of ours. It means that God wanted more for us than just life on earth. We get put into dirt and then it's done for us. No, God had an eternal plan. And in the eternal plan of salvation, it extends more to just your soul and your spirit. God's plan of redemption extends to your physical body as well. Scripture tells us in Revelation that Jesus redeems and makes all things new. The soul, the spirit, and the body, the complete person, God renews that for us. And the beautiful thing about that is it's not just when we make it to heaven. He renews the body here on earth. It is a full renewal of all that you are. Now, that's physical in heaven. But here on earth, spiritually, he renews you. He purifies you, and he makes you perfect. That's what Jesus is trying to do for you. And the resurrection proves that he can right here, right now on earth. The fourth thing, the resurrection means that God has demonstrated and shown his full power. He has displayed the full power of God through the resurrection. Now, the Bible describes Jesus' death on the cross as the greatest demonstration of love. When God left the safety and security of heaven to take on flesh, to be crucified, to be beaten, to be mocked, to hang on a cross, was the greatest demonstration of love because it bought back mankind from the devil because of our sin. He purchased us with his own blood, the greatest demonstration of love, shedding of blood to cleanse the world of sin. But the greatest demonstration of power is God raising Jesus from the grave, the empty tomb. It is the display of God's greatest power. And I also want us to understand this before we move on so much. It's not just eternity. Right here, right now, the God who loves you so much wants to display that same power in your life. He wants to make incredible things come through your life, through Jesus. He can make that come to life. The dead dryness that you may feel in your soul, in your spirit, even to your bones, through Christ, he can make you come to life. Breathe life into you, like water rushing through your body, restoring it back to its original purpose. The power of God can be real in your life, just like the love of God can be real in your life. Now five, the last thing, and then we transition to the last section. The last thing for the meaning of the resurrection, and this is one of the biggest, it means that Jesus' death on the cross, his payment for our sins that he offered was accepted by the Father. That the death of Jesus, the payment for sins, the the resurrection means God accepted that payment on behalf of us. We've been studying the book of Hebrews as a church. Just real quick, show of hands if you've been here for our Hebrews study. Will you show your hands? Awesome, that was a trick, so now you have to answer this question. I wanted to make sure that you actually had to speak today. Remember in our study of Hebrews, What did Jesus cry out when he's on the cross before he breathed his last breath? What did he cry out? What's the word? To telestai. Y'all remember that? To telestai, which literally means paid in full. I have paid the debt. I have canceled the punishment of, of sin, canceled the judgment of God and the wrath of God for all those who believe in Jesus as Lord. I have taken it. And the empty cross, the empty grave points to God's acknowledgement and acceptance of that payment. The empty tomb was evidence that God received that payment. I love how a pastor said it this way to get this image for us, that if the cross was the payment, then the empty tomb was the receipt. And if you think about that, that's wild to think that our God gives us receipts. 
You ever heard that? Like when you go get somebody who done something to you, you're like, I carry receipts, bro. I remember what you did to me. But our God gives us a different receipt. And he gives you the receipt of the empty tomb, not for him, but for you. Because when that devil comes to tell you you're not worthy, when that devil comes to sell that false narrative, to tell you you're not good enough, or that your past sins disqualify you from really receiving the grace of the Lord, or if that devil comes to drag you back to your old life, you have the receipt of the empty tomb that proves to you everything that he says is false and is a lie. Jesus showed us, I've accepted the punishment. Now live in that grace and mercy, not in the misery of who you used to be. The empty grave is our receipt to shake in the devil's face. The devil has lost that battle. That's why he's coming after you. He has lost that battle, and the empty tomb is the trophy to prove it. And guess what? That tomb is still empty today. Someone say amen. That tomb is still empty today. So it's not like he could say, no, it's filled now. No, it's still empty today. And you can go to that same tomb and see that there's nobody in there. The banner, the championship banner is still hanging in the rafters, and it's in the view of Jesus, who's at the right hand of the Father Almighty. Let me start to close this, because now we transition to the third scene, and this is, goes back to Mary. At some point, Mary left to get John and Peter, and then I guess she followed them back to the tomb, because at this point, John and Peter left again. But verse 11 tells us that Mary is still there. Look at verse 11. John and Peter left, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And it says, as she wept, she stooped to look inside the tomb. Let's sit on this for a second. Allow this to come to life for you. Remember the story or the description I told you in the beginning? That is why Mary is weeping. Everything she believed in, in Christ, is gone. Remember what I also told you about Mary's past? Try to, uh, try to think about why Mary is, is weeping. I wonder if when Mary ran to the tomb, it finally hit her that the one that she loved dearly, her Savior, I wonder if it finally hit her that he's really dead. You know, like in your own life, if a loved one has passed away, it takes a minute to fully understand that they're not coming back? Like you're so used to doing things with them, eating with them, hanging out with them, talking to them. And even though they're gone, it doesn't fully come. You, doesn't, you don't fully understand that until time passes on. Well, I wonder if Mary is weeping because as she looks in this tune, the weight of what just occurred finally hit her. And uncontrollably, she's just crying out. I wonder if it's a different reason. I wonder if Mary's thoughts of her past came back. Like, I wonder if she's weeping or crying more so because she's fearful. That, that since the man who freed her from the demons, since he died, then maybe those things will come back and attack me again. Maybe they'll haunt me again. Maybe they'll possess me again. Maybe they'll drag me back to who I used to be. Maybe she's weeping because her protector, her teacher, her mentor, her savior is gone. And now as she looks into this empty tomb, she doesn't take it as resurrection. She looks at it as I'm alone now. I'm hurt now. I'm afraid now. And now my past is coming for me. Have you ever been in that situation where you're so down, where you're so confused, where you're so angry, where you're so broken and hurt that the only thing you can think of is how unworthy you used to be and those lies creep in and they try to drag you back to who you used to be, your old identity, your old dead self, and your mind tries hard to tell you that's who you still are. I wonder if that's why Mary's crying. I thought I was over with this. I, I thought Jesus saved me, but now he's dead. And I don't know if you're like me, but those thoughts come to me all the time. As soon as I mess up, every single time, I think, oh no, here it goes again. I'm gonna lose control again. I'm gonna go back to who I was. Why do I keep screwing up? Why do I keep sinning? Why do I keep feeling like a failure? Why does this always happen to me? The devil sells the lies, and then I make up a scenario in my head, just like Mary. And then what happens? Do I go and I say, Jesus, I'm feeling bad. Can you help me out? 
Of course not. You know what I do? I run away and I go to the feet of Jesus and I say, don't help me. I say, where are you? You didn't show up again. I don't hear from you anymore. I don't feel you anymore. It's almost like someone literally stole the body of Jesus away from my soul. Can I encourage you if you feel that way? If that description fits you right now, I just want you to know something. You are not alone. You are not alone. And I want you to know something else. Those feelings, those thoughts, it's okay. Don't allow those things to torment you either. It's okay if you're in that season where you're like, God, I thought I knew you, but now I have no idea who you are, and it's almost like you're completely gone out of my life. That's okay. Don't don't feel bad. Don't think you're not worthy. It is okay to be like that. And you know why? Because sometimes that's the best place to be. Just like Mary, that sometimes is the best place to be. When you're in that season, it might be the best place to be. You know why? Because it causes you to look for something. You might not even be looking for Jesus, but you are looking for something better. You're like, this can't be it. This can't be the truth. So at least I'm going to look for something. And I want to encourage us to do the same thing Mary did. Look at that verse again. She said, she stood weeping outside the tomb, but as she's weeping in her brokenness and in her confusion and in her anger, the, it still did not stop her from looking, right? You, you get what I'm saying? In her pain and fear, it didn't stop her from seeking after Jesus. Like when we face those moments and in those seasons, don't let these burdens and sins and, and thoughts that pour into your head stop you from seeking Jesus, Seek him and seek him with affection. She stood weeping. With affection, she, she looked for Jesus. She sought after Jesus. And the promise is, it's the same for Mary as it is for us. If we actually look wholeheartedly and say, God, where are you? He will reveal himself. Look at verse 12 and 13. She looks in this tomb and she doesn't see Jesus. But instead, she sees two angels in white sitting where Jesus had been laying. Verse 13, they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Uh, What are you doing? Why are you weeping? And then again, she repeats, they have stolen the Lord. She still doesn't get it. I want to point this out real quick. Did you realize that she's literally talking to angels? And this is different than every other scripture when people see angels. You know, like when people see angels in scripture, what's the first words that it says that they say? Don't be afraid. I don't fear because angels are scary, right? I mean, to them, they're glowing most of the time. They're different beings. It's very clear this is not a human. It is an angelic being, a divine being. So when Mary sees them, notice how she didn't stop. She didn't have fear. All she said was, you're cool, angels. Like, I love the glow, but no disrespect to you. I don't want you. I want Jesus. Like, in life, I don't want the shiny things, that aren't the real thing. I want Christ himself. So can we get past this? And can you just tell me, where is my Lord? Verse 14 through 16. Having said this, Mary turned and she saw Jesus standing. But look at this. She did not know that it was Jesus. So many times in our life, we see and experience the living God, but we miss it because we are looking for something else. She's looking for a body that has no life. So many times we come into a church, we see people raise their hands, you actually see miracles of healing, but for some reason in your heart, you don't put it together that that is God, and so you miss the works and miracles of the Lord. You miss Jesus standing right in front of you because it doesn't look the way you expect it to. But Jesus has other plans still. Because if you seek him, he will reveal himself. Verse 15, Jesus then says, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Notice he didn't say, sit down and tell me everything that you're struggling with. I wanna know the dirt, Mary. Tell me your sins. Tell me the addictions you deal with. Tell me the fears. I wanna know everything. No, he doesn't say that. He goes right to the point. I don't need to know your junk. I need to point you to the person who can take care of the junk. Listen, just go straight for him. All you need is him, and he will handle all the stuff. And so when he turns around, verse 16, when she turns around, Jesus looks at her, and he says this one word, the gospel in one word, Mary. How beautiful. With love and compassion, 
All Jesus needed to say was her name. I wonder if that's the same way he called her when he delivered her from demonic forces. And in that moment, maybe it clicked. And she turned and she looked at the living Savior in Aramaic. She said, Rabboni, which means teacher. In other words, it's you. You're here, you're alive. How, how is this possible? How, how are you still, how are you in front of me? Mary, it's me. You know, the scripture we don't get to yet says that when Mary recognized she clung to Jesus so tight that even Jesus had to say, can you let go of me now? <laughs> I got work to do. Can you let go? And Mary's like, no, I lost you once. It ain't happening again. Mary, it's okay. Yeah, I rose and I ain't gonna die again. The resurrection, you wanna know what it means for you? The resurrection means that Jesus knows you by name, and he's calling you. Every single one of us, including myself, he is looking at you and in the core of who you are, in your heart, through the Holy Spirit, he is calling you by name. And by he calls you, he's trying to reveal himself in the fullness of who he is, the living, glorified Savior. The resurrection means for us that he will break every chain that is binding you right now. I don't even know if you realize this, but you have chains that are binding you right now. They are wrapping you up. If you're caught in sin, if you're caught in an addiction, if you're caught into the trap of, of, of things in your mind that you can't get rid of, those are chains holding you. And the resurrection means that he will break those things off of you. You can live in the freedom of who he is, not the, the slavery of those chains. The resurrection means he gives you a new purpose and defines your identity, just like he did to Mary. He will set your life back on the right path, even if he's already done it before. You think he's done? He's like, I've done that before, I ain't doing it again. Every day he gives you a new identity and defines your purpose. That's what the resurrection means. It means he will carry every burden that weighs you down, just like the cross weighed him down as he's carrying it up the hill. Those burdens he carries for you so you don't have to. The resurrection means he will restore you, calm your anxious heart. He'll give you healing in your relationships, comfort in your time of needs. And last but not least, the thing that it means the most, the resurrection proves that Jesus Christ is our king. Amen? So here's what we do at this church. Would you bow for me? We ask for response here. Listen, if this was a fairy tale, then I wouldn't ask you to do anything. I would tell you to tuck your kids in bed and go have a good night. If this wasn't true, then I would not ask you to seek in your heart and decide what the Holy Spirit's asking you to do. But the fact that I know it's real is because the Holy Spirit is speaking to people right here in this moment. He's revealing things to you right now. I have 100% assurance that if you open up your heart and seek him, the Holy Spirit will call you by name. So here's what I wanna ask. I ask for response in this church because if we hear the word, we must obey the word. If we don't obey it, then are we truly living out what God calls us to live out in our lives? Or are we just taking us as a fairy tale and a feel-good story? So here it is. I wanna ask that you raise your hand. That's all I'm asking you today here on this Easter because I know there's a lot of people you don't know. But that's okay. Because right now it's between you and the Lord, one-on-one. -on -one. If anybody in here has these burdens, these stresses of life that you feel are weighing you down in this moment right now, would you raise your hand so that we can see? Don't let uh, the, the hardness of your heart stop you in this moment. If you have your hands raised, let me tell you something. The resurrection means you no longer have to carry that burden. If Jesus was still in the tomb, bad news. That burden is there and it will never go away. But he's alive and he carries that burden for you. It is your responsibility now to lay it at his feet. To say, please God, release me from this burden. That's your role in this. 
He will do it if you ask and you let it go. Second, is there anybody in here, this is a little bit harder, is there anybody in here that feels like there's sins in their life that they can't get past, that they can't get rid of, and those sins keep reminding you of who you used to be, your dirt, the receipts of your old life keeps waving in your face. Is anybody in here right now, would you raise your hand if you feel that way? Don't be shy, church. We love each other here because we embrace our brokenness. To truly let God reveal himself to you and receive healing, you have to be open and honest in your brokenness. So raise them high. Good news for you. Your sins were nailed, were nailed to the cross with Jesus. His blood covered every single one of those sins that you just raised your hand about. And good news for you, the resurrection of Jesus means that God accepted that payment. So we, through his love and grace and mercy, are free from the shame, guilt, and condemnation of sin. It means no death for you, only life. Now leave that sin at the foot of Christ because he's already bought it. Don't keep holding on to something that's already been paid for. Give it away and live in the newness of his life, his new order of everlasting life. Last one. If you're in this room right now, whether you're a believer in Jesus or not, and you can honestly tell me that the Spirit of God has come to you in this moment, and it has called you by name. Would you raise your hand? That you feel the Holy Spirit moving in your life. And he reminds you, I'm real, I'm here, because he called you by name in your heart. And here's what I ask that we do. During this next song, we've done this for three services now. And with boldness and courage, people responded. But during this last song, if you raised your hand for any reason, or maybe you didn't even raise your hand, but you want to come down to the altar, I want to encourage you to do that. Don't be afraid to get out of that seat. That seat is nothing for you. Come to the altar. And we come to the altar in this church, one as a sign of response, but also as a sign to say, Lord, I am giving you my life as a sacrifice, and I'm not afraid who sees it. I understand the meaning of the cross and the meaning of the resurrection, and in you I have the freedom of life, so I will celebrate at your feet at this altar. As we sing this song in worship, would you come forward and give your life to Jesus as a sacrifice for what he has done for you? We serve the God who reigns forever and ever, who has healed, who has saved, who has redefined your future, and he is worthy of our praise. Amen.